So we're going to pick up right where we left off um, with the last section three where we uh, were using some synthetic division and some stuff like that to basically divide polynomials. Now, when you think about it, dividing polynomials is pretty much the same as factoring. You're, you're taking something out of the other one and you're um, more or less figuring out what you would have left if you took that out of it or if you divided it into something. Okay, we're going to use that same idea as we move forward here. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to show how you can use synthetic division to factor. We're also going to talk a little bit about um, how you can group something in factoring. And what you're looking at there is when you have more than three terms, uh, specifically four terms, there is still a way that you can factor that out. Um, even though basically what we've talked about so far has been binomial stuff and trinomial stuff. All right, and then the last thing that we're going to talk about is um, similar to if you have a difference of squares. Uh, we talked about how to factor stuff like this in the past where we go x plus 3, x minus 3. All right, now we're going to talk about what you can do if you have what would be like a difference or a sum of cubes. Okay, where down here both terms happen to be squares or you had to take something times themselves. Uh, to get what was there as far as the x squared and the 9. Here you will notice that the x to the third and the 8 are both perfect cubes or basically you have to take something times itself three times uh, to get what's going on there and there's a way that you can factor it. Now as far as that goes it's not something that you're going to have to memorize um, it's something more or less that you're going to use based on a formula that you're given. Alright now Basically, what we're going to talk about here first is kind of a review of what we talked about before. Um, if you go through the division process, whether it's polynomial long division or synthetic division, if your remainder becomes zero, more or less what that means is whatever you were dividing into uh, the original polynomial uh, or whatever your divisor was happens to be a factor and the other factor would be the answer that you get uh, left over when you're done. Okay, so basically down here we're talking about remainder theorem. Okay, remainder theorem just basically says more or less in a more mathematical way what I just talked about. Okay, um, if you have a remainder of zero, that means that those, you know, the divisor is a factor. The, uh, the answer that you get out of the quotient is also the other factor you would have left. All right. The other thing would be, and we talked about this, um, if you're dividing by something that's in this form, if you were to evaluate the original function for a, okay, finding f of a, or in this case down here it's represented with a p, p of a, whatever your remainder is, uh, that would be the value that you would get out if you were to actually evaluate that function in that specific value. Okay, so down here just to kind of do summarize a little bit. Okay, x minus a or whatever you divide into something, whatever your divisor is, is going to be a factor of the original polynomial that is your dividend or what you're dividing into if and only if your remainder is zero. Okay, so in this case here, Say you were to go ahead and fill 1 in, or you used x minus 1 was your divisor, and you divided it into something. Okay, For example, this was your dividend or your original uh, number, or excuse me, expression that was underneath the division bar. Okay, If you go all the way through that and you get a 0 as a remainder, that means that x minus 1 would be a factor of that original polynomial. Okay, On the other hand, and we're looking at this here too, the number that you take, if you fill it in and try to evaluate it into the function, the 1, that means that the value you get out is going to be 0. Now, there's a lot going on there. This will make more sense once we actually get into some uh, actual examples to kind of explain what's going on. So, really what we're going to start with here is you're going to be given a polynomial and you're going to be given a, bi a binomial. Okay, What you're trying to figure out is, is the binomial a factor of the polynomial. So over here on the left, this is my binomial, this is my polynomial. Now because this is in that x minus a form, 
Okay, I can go ahead and use synthetic division. So remember, it's opposites. Because it's x plus 1, I'm going to put negative 1 in my little division box. And then I'm going to write down the coefficients. 1, negative 3, and 1. 1, negative 3, and 1. And then I'm going to perform synthetic division. Drop the first term, multiply, um, add those together. Negative 1 times negative 4 gives you positive 4, which gives you 5. Now, again, the last number is your remainder. In this case, the remainder is not 0. So that means that x plus 1 is not a factor of this polynomial. Okay, now we'll look at the one over here on the left. Negative 2 would be my number that goes in the box. If I write out my uh, coefficients, all right, and I go ahead and do my synthetic division. Drop the 3, get negative 6, get 0, 0, negative 5, positive 10, I get 0. Okay, so my remainder is 0. That means that x plus 2 is a factor of that polynomial that's there. Now, one other thing, and I'm going to look at what my answer is. Remember down here, these down here would represent the coefficients of your answer. All right, and we drop it a degree, so that means I have 3 x to the third, no x squared term, that would be minus 5x. Okay, so what that means is this is actually one of your factors that would go with the x plus 2 that we originally started with. Okay, so if you were, you know, to use that synthetic division process and you get done and you find out that something is a factor of the original polynomial, all right, you can actually take and write things in factored form all right, based on what you have. Okay, The x plus 2, we know that was a factor because we got 0 as a remainder. All right, What's left, these coefficients, represent the answer, the quotient that I would have left, which would then be the other factor, or basically what's left after you take an x plus 2 out. All right, If you were to multiply these together, or basically FOIL, you would get back to this original polynomial that we had right here. Now the next thing you can do with this, and this is kind of taking things a step further, is when you look at the factored result that you still have left here, if you wanted to go ahead and take a look at this, you could go ahead and try to factor it even further. Now we're down to something that only has two terms, so it'd be something to be a little bit easier for us to work with. We could say, hey, these right here look like they have an x in common. I could go ahead and take an x out and see if I could get any further as far as what my answer, you know, my factored uh, version of that answer would happen to be. All right, now we're not going to do that right now, but just know when you write something in its factored form, like we did down here, you always want to look to see is there any part of that or any factors that I have that I could actually even factor more than I already have. Okay, um, now we're going to kind of move to that next segment I talked about. Uh, we've done a lot of factoring so far as far as, you know, factoring trinomials, difference of squares, things like that. Uh, there is one other method that we're going to talk about here as far as factoring goes. And that just deals with something that one um, has a power that is greater than two or the highest power is greater than two. And you'll also notice something up here. You have more than three terms. All right, you have more than three terms. So what that means is, um, you're not going to be able to just simply use your two sets of parentheses thing that we've used in the past uh, to try to make this work. So what we're going to do is we're going to factor uh, using a technique that is referred to as grouping. All right, Now, the way that you group these can vary. Uh, a lot of times what happens is it ends up being the first two together and the last two terms together. All right, But essentially when you make your groups, uh, it doesn't always have to work that way, but what you can look for is which um, terms have the most in common. For example, I group these first two together right here, all right, because they have the most in common. I can take an x squared out of both of those. And it makes sense to put these two together because I can actually take a negative 25 out of both of those. Had I mixed things around a little bit, uh, it might not have worked out so well. I could probably still take things out, but this tends to make the most sense. Now, there is a key here that you have to look for and I'll explain that here in a second. So once I group them, what I'm looking for is exactly what I just talked about. What do they have in common? Well, I already said I could take an x squared out of both of those, and then I'm going to go ahead and write what would be left. 
Okay. Now the key is what's left in the parenthesis here. When I factor the second group that I made, I have to get the exact same thing in the parenthesis behind it. Otherwise, uh, my factoring didn't work. Okay, or my grouping didn't work. So I'm looking at these up here. I said, well, I'm going to take out a negative 25. All right, if I take out a negative 25, that means I'm going to have an x minus 1 left. Again, this and this are the same. That means that I factored it correctly. If you end up with something that is not the same in those two parentheses, that means you grouped wrong or you factored wrong. All right, and you have to go back and try it over again. All right, now, as far as what you write for your answer, that is not your answer. I take the parts that are in front of the parentheses, x squared minus 25, and then I take what's in the parentheses, and that would be my next step as far as how I write my factored answer. Now, the key here is you don't have to write the x minus 1 more than once. You only have to write it one time. Okay, you don't have to write it twice, even though it shows up twice here. You only write it once. Now, again, like I talked about with that synthetic division stuff that we showed earlier, you still need to take a look at what you have for factors here and see if you could take either of them or maybe just one of them and factor it even more than it already is. And if you look here, you'll see on the left, this is actually a difference of squares. All right, so I could go ahead and take that, go x plus 5 x minus 5, and then I'd still have that x minus 1 here at the end. And this would be my complete factored answer. All right. Now, something important to remember. First, when you get to this step right here, all right, if you were to go ahead and distribute or basically FOIL this, all right, you will get back to what you started with. Okay, so that's one way to check to make sure that you're on the right track as you go through this. Same thing down here. If I were to go ahead and FOIL, you know, say FOIL these first two, all right, it would get me back to that x squared minus 25, and then again, you could take this step and multiply it out and get back to what you originally started with. So as I've mentioned before when we're factoring, there's really never a reason to get a factoring problem wrong because it's so easy to check everything all the way through. It might not be the shortest process to check everything, but when you're factoring, like I said, you should never get anything wrong because you always have the means to be able to check to make sure that you're on the right track. All right, here's another example. I want you to go ahead and pause your video uh, and try this one on your own just to see that you're you know, on the right track as far as what we did on the previous slide. Okay, so four terms right away, dead giveaway, we need to group. So I'm going to group this. Again, it looks like the first two and the last two probably have the most in common with each other. So if I look at this first group right here, it looks like they have an x squared in common. So I'm going to take out an x squared, which means I'm going to have x minus 2 left. Okay, it's a start. doesn't necessarily mean we're right. But what that means is when I look at the second part, which looks like it has a negative 9 uh, in common here, I get those x minus 2's behind each part. Now, one of the most common mistakes I see with something like this is people take out a 9 instead of a negative 9. Well, if this is a positive 9, what that means is this 2 in here becomes positive instead, and then you no longer have the same thing in your parentheses. So anytime you have a negative in front of that third term or the first term in your second group, you want to think about, I'm probably going to have to use a negative when I factor out. Okay, and you're going to have to play with that a little bit in there uh, just to make sure that you do, in fact, get the same thing in both of those parentheses when you try to factor your groups. If you don't, that means, one, you either factored wrong, or two, you grouped incorrectly at the very beginning. All right, next step, writing what I actually have for factors. And again, you only have to write the x minus 2 part one time. Okay, you don't have to write it twice. If you were to FOIL this right here, you would get back to what you started with. Okay, now look at what you have left. All right, and we want to say, well, x squared minus 9 is a difference of squares. So I can go ahead and factor that out, and then I leave the x minus 2. So this would be my factored answer. Okay, so it's one of those things that's new to you. I know it's new to you, but... 
it's something that's not extremely difficult as long as you're kind of paying attention to what's going on up here in the process itself. All right, now we did review a little bit kind of the difference of squares thing there. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is just what happens when you have a sum of two cubes and a difference of two cubes. And the key with this is if you look at the formulas or the basic structure that's given to you here for how this is supposed to work, basically what it comes down to is figuring out what the base of each cube is. Okay? Or if you think about this, what is A and what is B? Okay? Or what did I have to multiply times itself three times to get what's actually shown there. Okay, now you should write these formulas down Okay, over here because you're going to want to refer back to them as we go. Again, it's one of those things where I'm not going to make you memorize them, all right? but you need to be aware of what the formulas are and how they work because I'm not going to give them to you uh, necessarily all the time. All right, So you're going to have to use your own materials to go ahead and find that stuff. Okay, so if we start with something like this, all right, Initially, it does not necessarily look like a sum of cubes, sum because it has the plus in it. But um, I want to treat it just like I would treat anything else that I've factored before. What does it have in common? What do those two have in common that I might be able to take out um, and make things a little bit easier? So I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that I have an x in common for sure. My guess would be if I pull up my calculator and divide 108 by 4, it goes in there evenly. Okay, so I'm going to take out a 4x, which would leave me with x to the third plus 27. Okay, so what I'm looking at now is the 4x doesn't really matter a whole lot. It's going to be part of my factored answer. All right, but this now should be a sum of cubes, or basically the x to the third and the 27 are both perfect cubes. All right, the key here is, based on your formulas you had before, you had an A and a B, or this would take on the whole A to the third plus B to the third formula that was written there before. Okay, what we're looking at right now is, can we figure out what the base of each of those cubes is? Or what is A and what is B? Well, A, in this case, is just gonna be X, and B is gonna be three. Okay, because if I take x times x times x, I would get x to the third. If I take 3 times 3 times 3, I would get 27. So those are the bases of my cubes. Now what I'm looking at is, I'm just going to use those formulas that were on the previous slide. Okay, the sum of cubes basically says in my first parenthesis, and I'll leave the 4x out front. All right, first parenthesis, I should have a plus b, so basically x plus 3. And that's why um, it's important to figure out what those bases are. The next one says a squared, okay, which in this case is going to be x squared, minus a times b, so minus 3x, and then plus b squared, which is going to be plus 9. Okay, now that's what the formula tells me to get to. Now a little hint here, okay. This part back here that has three terms, if you have a sum of cubes or a difference of cubes, after you go through the formula process like we just did, I'm going to tell you this part back here is almost never, ever, ever going to be factorable or more factorable than it already has been factored out. Okay, and if you look at what we got going on here, plus 9 would tell me that we need to have the same sign. There's no way you can have factors of 9 with the same signs that are going to add up to negative 3. You can always check to make sure or see if this part can be factored anymore, but I tell you 9 times out of 10, you're not going to be able to go any further than what you get based on the formula. Okay. The only thing you'll want to watch out for is sometimes this part right here ends up being a difference of squares, so if that were the case, you might have to factor that a little bit more. But for the sake of what we just did, this is going to be your factored result, okay, or your factored answer. All right. I want you to go ahead and, well, we can just run through this one together. I won't, I'll save the next one on the next slide for that. Now, this one here, again, we'd want to look, um, because of the minus sign, it looks like it should be a difference of cubes. Um, this one, they don't really have anything in common. 8 and 125 don't really have anything uh, that we could take out together. And actually, when you think about it, 
125 and 8 are already perfect cubes, so we wouldn't really want to take anything out if we didn't have to. So again, um, difference of cubes looks like this. I want to figure out what my A is and what my B is, so it makes filling into the formula a little bit easier. So it looks like, you know, if you were to take more or less the third root of 125, um, you would get 5, and then D, because D is the base of that D to the third, and then um, see the base of 8 would be 2, or 2 times 2 times 2 gives you 8. All right, and back up here, 5D times 5D times 5D will give you 125D to the third. So those are the bases of what I have written up there. And then from there, like I said, just follow what the formula tells you. All right, it says for difference of cubes, A minus B in the first parenthesis. And then we go A squared, which would be 25 d squared plus a b so plus 10 d and then plus b squared should be plus 4 all right now again that second one right there you can look at it all you want it it probably isn't going to be factorable you know you, they don't have anything in common you can take out uh, factors of 4 really aren't going to do much for you there so this is broken down as far as it can go so my answer it's going to be that part right there. All right, so again, sum and difference of cubes really aren't terribly difficult uh, because you're mostly using a formula. The key is figuring out what your base is for your perfect cubes. Makes things a lot easier when we go ahead and fill in. All right, why don't you go ahead and give this one a try? All right, pause it, work through it, see what you can come up with. Okay, now this is one of those where obviously. Um, because we have x to the fifth and x to the second in there, we probably are going to be able to take something out of this. So I'm going to go ahead and say they have a 2 and an x squared in common. So I'm essentially going to divide that out. So I'd be left with an x to the third minus 8. Okay, so this part's going to stay up front. It's just going to be part of my factored result. Um, in here, it should be fairly easy to see that I have a difference of cubes. So I'm going to figure out the base of both of my cubes. I'm going to have x and I'm going to have 2. All right, at that point, we just want to use our formula. All right, so the 2x squared is going to stay in front because even though it's not a part of your difference of cubes, it's still part of your factored answer. All right, difference of cubes, we're going to go a minus b. Then I'm going to go a squared plus a times b plus b squared. Okay, and again, you're not going to be able to do much with that trinomial at the end, so this is going to be my factored answer. Okay, relatively straightforward. Hopefully, you're okay with how that is supposed to work. All right, now, last thing, and again, story problems have always really seemed to be uh, a point that we struggle with because um, we don't really bother to read through things, we just kind of look at them and assume, oh, there's words involved, I don't want to mess with it. Okay? Again, it's going to be based on all the stuff that we dealt with in the lesson. Okay, so what this one is saying is, you have a function, v of x equals x to the third plus 6x squared plus 3x minus 10. Identify the values of x for which v of x equals 0. Then use the graph to factor v of x. All right, so what we're looking at here is first, the x values for which v of x equals 0. Well, more or less, what we'd be looking for is the roots or the zeros of this particular function. So if you look at what's going on here, it's relatively easy to see we have a 0 or a root here, a 0 or a root here, and a 0 or a root right there. Okay? Then it says use the graph to factor. So there's a couple different ways we could do this. What you could do is you could take, say, negative 5. You could fill in the synthetic division, take the coefficients of your original function, and you could go ahead and work through this and figure out, well, I put minus 5 in. I got a remainder of 0. So what that means is x plus 5 is a factor of this. 
So I would be down to x plus 5 because remember it's opposite. We filled negative 5 in. That means x plus 5 is actually my factor. And then the remainder says x squared plus x minus 2 would be left over. Okay. So to this point, this would be what I have. Now, you could use synthetic division again to take one of these other zeros over here, negative 2 or 1, and divide them into this part and go further. Or you could see, hey, it's a trinomial. It's a trinomial that looks like it's factorable on its own. So I might even be able to just do that without even having to fill in anything else. X, X, looks like we're going to have different signs. So I'm going to go plus 2, minus 1. And it looks like those would be the other two factors that we have going on here. And that would make sense because if you have x plus 2, that would mean we'd intersect at minus 2 because it's opposite. If you have x minus 1, that means you'd intersect at plus 1. Again, think about taking each of those factors and setting them equal to 0. And when you set them equal to 0 on solve, the numbers that you would get would represent the points at which your graph crosses the x-axis. Kind of one of the basic things we talked about, but one of the very important things that you have to deal with in algebra. All right, the other way to think about it is you might not have to do any synthetic division at all if you remember that when you have zeros of negative 5, negative 2, and 1, that you have factors of x plus 5, x plus 2, and x minus 1, All right, which is essentially what we got down there. So if you can figure that out just by looking at that or remembering, how factors and zeros are related to each other, um, you're going to be okay with figuring out how that works. Okay? So that pretty much brings us to the conclusion of what we wanted to get through today. Um, hopefully, this is one of those things that wasn't terribly difficult um, and we're able to kind of navigate through it on your own. All right, now just make sure that you get your notes and all that stuff filled out. Hopefully, you uh, work out some of the problems on there. Uh, when we come back to class, together be prepared for you know some type of quiz over the basics of what was discussed in this particular uh, video Thank you.